Patoka. I direct the Medical Humanities and Bioethics Master's Program here at Northwestern, and I am truly delighted to welcome you to our Montgomery Lecture Series, which is very affectionately named for one of our founding faculty members, Catherine Montgomery. And it's a series that functions as part of a class for our MA students, but we've also um, long held it open to the wider public. And in this final Montgomery session of the academic year, we've actually joined forces, as we sometimes do, with several other groups across the university to bring a pair of speakers, Dr. Eugene Richardson and Dr. Paul Farmer, whose work we knew would be of pressing and really keen interest quite broadly across our community. So I'm so pleased to be able to also thank the Institute for Public Health and Medicine, the Institute for Global Health, and the Department of Anthropology for joining in co-sponsoring and helping to disseminate this event. It is truly a deep pleasure and a real privilege to all of us to have um, our speakers here with us today. Now, as I mentioned, this is our last talk in the series for the academic year, um, but it actually serves, I think, really beautifully as a kind of inflection point, actually, both closing out this year's Montgomery Lectures and also providing a kind of opening to two other upcoming events that I just want to be sure this audience is aware of. First, tomorrow, um, on Friday, the Center for Global Health Education is hosting a Global Health Education Day that will include a full day of programming including, it turns out, a keynote lecture by Dr. Abebe Bekele, who is, it so happens, Deputy Vice Chancellor for the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. We did not plan that in quite this way, but it's pretty lovely um, because that's a new university envisioned as an educational extension of the work of Partners in Health, a renowned organization co-founded by Dr. Farmer. And as further food for our collective global health thinking, we'd also like to inv invite you to a four-part conference series entitled Health Across Borders, for which today's session is meant as a kind of keynote kickoff. Um, the Health Across Borders Conference, organized by the Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities and co-sponsored again by both IFAM and the Institute for Global Health, will be held over the next four Thursdays at the noon hour and will feature each week a set of brief presentations from a very interdisciplinary group of scholars that's intended to generate thinking and conversation around the role of borders meant both geographically and conceptually um, in the dynamics of inclusion and exclusion in global health. So please join us for that as well if you can. Before I introduce our esteemed speakers today, uh, just a couple of quick words on logistics with our especially large audience today. We've shifted to a webinar mode and we are recording and I believe that recording will be made available on YouTube. Um, we'll have until 1 p.m. together and each of our speakers I think will present for about 15 or 20 minutes and then we'll plan to have 10 to 15 minutes for questions and discussion. Um, please direct your questions to the Q&A and we will use those to moderate what I anticipate will be a very lively conversation. Um, also please note that the live transcript uh, feature has been enabled at the bottom of your Zoom screen if anyone needs that um, for better access. So our two speakers, Dr. Eugene Richardson and Dr. Paul Farmer, are both physician anthropologists who come to us today with two new books that they've recently published. And these books are each quite distinct and really fascinating to bring into conversation together. Broadly speaking, both books ask a set of questions about how the specific histories and epistemologies and material practices of global public health fundamentally shape the way epidemics unfold and inequality deepens. For both speakers, these are questions forged on the clinical front lines of the Ebola outbreaks, where they have in fact worked together. Um, and their respective books each offer different analytic frameworks that challenge us to rethink and work to revise the relationships and the lines of responsibility between epidemics, inequality, and the field of public health. So first we will hear from Dr. Richardson, who received his MD from Cornell University and his PhD in anthropology from Stanford, um, where he then went on to complete residency in internal medicine, as well as fellowship in infectious disease and geographic medicine. Currently, he's an assistant professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Richardson previously served as the clinical lead on Ebola response in the Kono district in Sierra Leone for Partners in Health, and he continues to conduct research on the social epidemiology of Ebola virus disease there. Dr. Richardson also worked as a clinical case management consultant for the WHO's Ebola repost in Bini Democratic Republic of the Congo. More recently, he was seconded to the Africa CDC to join their COVID-19 response. His overall focus is on biosocial approaches to epidemic disease, prevention, containment, and treatment in Sub-Saharan Africa. As part of this effort, he's chaired the Lancet Commission on, the Repar on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. And his book, which we'll be sharing from today, is Epidemic Illusions on the Coloniality of Global Public Health. 
And after we've heard, had a chance to hear from Jean, we'll turn things over to Dr. Farmer, who is a medical anthropologist and physician and someone for whom any attempt at introduction seems simultaneously inadequate and superfluous. Um, Dr. Farmer holds an MD and a PhD from Harvard University, where he's the Colicatronis University Professor and the Chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Farmer has dedicated his life to improving healthcare for the world's poorest people. He is co-founder and chief strategist of Partners in Health, an international nonprofit organization that since 1987 has provided direct uh, healthcare services and undertaken research and advocacy activities on behalf of those who are sick and living in poverty. He's also professor of medicine and chief of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Farmer is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Bratislav Malinowski Award and the Margaret Mead Award from the Society for Applied Anthropology, the Outstanding International Physician Nathan Davis Award from the American Medical Association, and a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, also with his PIH colleagues, the Hilton Humanitarian Prize. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences and at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And his most recent book on which I think he'll be drawing some today as well is Fevers, Feuds and Diamonds, Ebola and the Ravages of History. We're so fortunate to have both of them joining us today and I'm very happy indeed to now turn things over to Dr. Richardson. Thanks so, thanks so much, Megan. It's an honor to join you all today and, and thanks to the Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities and IFAM and um, looking forward to the discussion. I'm just gonna present some slides really quick uh, on uh, main topics in my book. Uh, let's see, share screen. All right, and try to go through these quick so we can get to the fun part with discussion with Paul. Um, so the book is called uh, Epidemic Lesions on the Coloniality of Global Public Health, and this kind of sums it up in a nutshell, um, this gift here that, you know, when it comes to, I take this, you know, neo-Kantian approach to uh, social phenomena that they are very distinct from, you know, physical phenomena, that they are always subject to interpretation, they're always subject to curation of data, um, and that um, we can always find more just ways of describing uh, you know, social and health phenomena. And so, you know, when we forget that and places start to, uh, you know, impose ways of understanding the world, essentially colonize people's uh, um, uh, viewpoints, then they go for, um, then they tend to achieve this monopoly on truth. So the original shield says we're after truth. And this one reminds us that sometimes we uh, hold a monopoly on it. So no financial relationships with commercial entities to disclose. Here's the cover of the book and it's a, here's a, a similar um, metaphor. So you know, what we inherited from Plato and friends was the allegory of the cave, uh, which is just a single burrow where people are chained to the wall and all they can see are the images from these figures, and here's a coronavirus here. And the idea is that there are philosophers or social scientists or epidemiologists that can sneak out of the cave and go up into the, to the real world and, and see what capital T truth is and then come back and tell people what it's about. And that is sort of, that promotes a kind of universal way of interpreting social phenomena. Um, but if we think of, um, you know, that mode of interpretation as pluriversal, then the Warren, is a more appropriate uh, allegory. And that's where there are a variety of ways of interpreting social phenomena, of curating facts um, that all vie for the forefront of our consciousness. Um, and it's really the work of ideology that makes some sit, stick better than others. And usually the ones that stick are the ones that support elite interests. And, um, and the book is essentially about how uh, what we call global public health science uh, and, and what, how we think of it as this objectively value, you know, objectively neutral value-free pr pursuit actually carries a lot of ideological baggage um, and, um, you know, does neoliberal work, for example, carries Western cultural imperialism with it. So my position, um, you know, in the old school anthropology of investigating the other is not to, you know, 
speak about what the, uh, you know, represent people's experiences of epistemic violence, but more so to, to report on how it's committed. Since I represent through my, you know, work in uh, UN agencies or NGOs or elite universities or, um, you know, uh, uh, CDC, things like that, um, these centers of calculation. Um, it's, to, it's to report on how epistemic violence is committed. Um, and so I'll give a few examples of that. Um, one thing I like to you know, try to convey to uh, public health practitioners is that, you know, this current model we have of aid and development sort of somewhat presupposes this moral relation between the global health, North and South as one of saviors. You know, the global North has come to its wealth and riches through its own hard work or, you know, Jared Diamond, um, uh, you know, accumulation of grains and germs and steel. Um, and, and that lends itself towards, you know, sharing that excess wealth in the form of charity. But if you really trace things historically and see that the you know, current transnational relations of inequality are such that people in the global North are supporters of and beneficiaries of an institutional order that systematizes oppression, then the model of intervention actually changes to one of reparative justice, you know, repairing the legacies that have led to these um, uh, to this inequality in the first place. And so uh, the book is also essentially about how, um, you know, reparative justice can take symbolic form as well, discursive form. So uh, essentially symbolic reparations. Uh, the, the framework I use is coloniality and it's, you know, uh, it's somewhat similar to what uh, Kwame Nkrumah described as neocolonialism or Cedric Robinson described as uh, racial capitalism. Um, to me, this ties together um, you know, oppressive forces in a way that they you know, um, can be described. But again, you know, people in my colleagues that work on um, our section of the reparations committee or commission for uh, descendants of people enslaved in the US would say, well, you know, our ancestors were not colonized, they were enslaved or we have another section on caste would, um, you know, say this is this is a caste system, there's not coloniality. But um, the, the idea that um, other people's life worlds are colonized um, is, is germane to the book. And so coloniality can be described as the matrix of power relations um, that persistently manifest despite a former colony's achievement of nationhood. It attempts to capture racial, political, economic, social, epistemological, linguistic, and gendered hierarchical orders imposed by European colonialism that transcended decolonization and continue to oppress in accordance with the needs of capital. Um, the heterogeneous and multiple global structures put in place over 450 years did not evaporate with independence continue to live under the same colonial power matrix. We've just moved from global colonialism to this period of global coloniality. And uh, Sabelo and Glovo has to say that despite the celebration of decolonization as a milestone in the African history of liberation, Africa has not managed to free itself from epistemological colonization. Inscribed on the continent and its people by mission and secular schools, schools of tropical medicine, schools of public health, NGOs, religious denominations, and other institutions that carry Western cultural imperialism. And so the book is a, a you know, feeble attempt um, to, to um, model on Saeed's Orientalism, how he showed that what we thought is, you know, this social scientific discipline was actually a carrier uh, of Western cultural imperialism. I try to do the same with works of uh, public health science to show how they carry Western cultural imperialism. So what I'm really interested in is how people's perceptions are colonized. And there's a variety of examples in the book and, and we can get to some in the discussion. Um, I'll give a, a few at the end uh, of these slides, but essentially, you know, if colonialism imposed its control on the social production of wealth through military conquest and subsequent political dictatorship, its most important area of domination was the mental universe, the control through culture, how people perceive themselves and their relationship to the world. And the book tries to trace how, you know, public health studies essentially really impose ways of understanding health phenomena on people, ways that don't jive with what, uh, you know, people are telling us. 
I refer to you know these modes of uh, you know data curation as bourgeois empiricism because uh, they often obscure socio-historical forces, and and since they do, they are themselves political acts, which give support to social structures that hide behind scientific objectivity to perpetuate dependency, exploitation, racism, elitism, colonialism. I also use the term uh, symbolic violence, which is, you know, again, what I've been saying all along, it's this, it's this ability to impose the means for comprehending the phenomena around you. And if you think that, you know, there is no capital T truth to the, to, you know, how we describe human behavior, how we describe social phenomena, and here I'm not talking about, you know, mask, prevent transmission, physiologic stuff, or three quarks make a proton, physical stuff. I'm talking about um, the description of human behavior or social phenomena. And that I think, again, can never be uh, dissociated from the ideological presuppositions that you come to, uh, come with it. And so if you're imposing, if you're putting out there ways, definitive ways of interpreting things, then you're imposing interpretations on people. Uh, the book also uses determinement, which is kind of this 50s, 60s French um, uh, method of taking, you know, advertising posters and rearranging symbols uh, to, to make a more protest message. I mean, I think this poster itself imposes a way of understanding the world, although it's supposed to be informative to tell you, you know, this is the, uh, when you're sick to go to the health center. Um, and this is the poster you would see when we landed in uh, 2014 in and Sierra Leone, it also to me says that Ebola is a cause of this sickness, is a, is a cause of you having to go here. And for me, Ebola is just a marker on, on a sort of determinative web of, of various forces that essentially lead to an underdeveloped health center, which doesn't, um, which is unable to contain uh, Ebola outbreaks. So we have another paper out in uh, the review of African political economy where it's actually uh, uh, discuss how, you know, just taxes on the diamonds that have been stolen from the country alone could have been, could have built a health infrastructure that would have stopped Ebola in its place. And that'll be relevant in a few slides for when we talk about super spreading. But this poster here talks about the actual, uh, you know, what I think of as more distal causes of, of what we're, or distal determinants, I should say, of, of what's on the left. So we have epistemic violence, you know, the IMF structurally adjusting, the Holocaust of slavery, barbaric colonialism, purposeful underdevelopment. Unless you think that there, that there actually is such thing as development, um, you can look at this um, slide from 2017, which totaled up uh, illicit financial flows to the continent of Africa, showing that $162 billion came into the continent in the form of aid, loans, and remittances. But $200 billion came out just in illicit financial flows, like illegal theft of money, resource theft, tax evasion, trade misinvoicing. So the continent is a net creditor of $40 billion to the global north. There's no such thing as development, you know, using the excess wealth of the rich global north to, to help out the global south. They are developing us. They, uh, they are continuing to be uh, this, these extractive industries that were started during the colonial era continue to this day. They're just disguised by um, shell companies and, and tax evasion, such that I would, I would posit that something like the uh, Panama Papers were one of the strongest global health interventions of the past five years, where you know, we're actually starting to lift the lid on how these illicit financial flows take place. Because if there weren't any of these flows, we wouldn't be talking about big Ebola outbreaks in the first place. The resources would be there to contain them. Um, so the book goes into how um, you know uh, social scientists, epidemiologists can can be serve as apparatchiki or you know uh, instruments of of neoliberal ideologies. Um, and uh, here's a kind of more general article in the Wilson Quarterly uh, about um, how you know, not the tools we use for public health, how actual human public health professionals are used as instrument, instruments by um, dominant ideologies. Um, and so I, you know, um, look to this, this quote here from Foucault that, you know, the role of, of uh, the social scientist uh, sometimes is not to go after this capital D truth, that we don't even believe that there is a capital T truth to go after um, as far as um, social phenomena are concerned, but rather to uh, struggle against the forms of power where you are both an object and an instrument. 
Um, one of the main critiques is about mathematical models of infectious disease transmission, that they you know, really are merely fables dressed in for formal language. Their job is to gather our social imaginary to envision a different future. Um, and since that future is socially constructed, um, there, there can be no outbreak science. You know, there is not, nothing objective about them. So for the most part, um, these models serve not as forecasts, but as means of setting epistemic confines to the understanding of why some group um, which live sicker lives than others. And this article here is the afterword of the book that exists as a standalone in BMJ, Global Health. So quickly, what does symbolic violence look like? Here's a paper um, from some uh, Princeton and MSF peoples um, in PNAS about super spreading. They use the term super spreader 38 times in the article. And this is the news this is like the newspaper article that came out after that scientific publication. They interviewed the authors. And they basically, th this is the conclusion, it's written in the scientific paper, that super spreaders drove the Ebola epidemic. And this is what they're calling, this uh, poor patient is who, what they're calling a super spreader. Um, you know, and are we, this is what a critical theorist does, right? They don't look at the kind of truth value of the categories we use, because it is, it may be true that, you know, 20% of individuals spread to 80% of people. They look at what kind of work that does. And the kind of work that does is it supports these neoliberal notions of rational choice and bounded uh, individuals um, such that it vitiates any, um, any understanding of kind of distal determinants. Um, if we were to look at him more relationally and think of him as maybe a personally, uh, personal protective equipment direct care nexus, um, and, and that which would help us think like along the, uh, the socio, the determinative web, then why wouldn't we call the mining company that I spoke to earlier as a super spreader? Because it has set the foundations for super spreading for 28,000 cases plus uh, because, of the, because of resource theft. And so to me, it's equally truthful to call that uh, company a super spreader, but you'll never see that in any of the epidemiological literature um, because it, you know, the, the basic ideology informing it, uh, the epidemiological literature is mostly neoliberal. It's not neo-Marxist. Um, so I critique epidemiology as a disposi T for apparatus. There's critiques of causal inference, big data, um, regression models and epidemic modeling. And lastly, I'll just conclude with a quick, quick critique of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Um, you know, there's this good article in The Nation by Tim Schwab, our Bill Gates is billions distorting public health data. I would say yes. Um, the foundation has given over $600 million to the IHME. Um, and this is the kind of stuff they produce. So their forecasts last year were wrong over 70% of the time. Um, this is last spring. But their plunging projections were also used by Trump to show that he was doing um, you know, good work. So they're easily co-opted for ideological purposes. But you know, since they endorse a future, where COVID disparities continue to exist. That is, they mention nothing about risk structure. They only recommend masks, social distancing, nothing about the, the structural determinants of why people of color are at higher risk of infection. Um, then they endorse the, you know, then they actually do racist work because, you know, if we take Ibram Kendi's definition that a racist policy or analysis is one that, you know, either furthers or continues status quo inequalities, these forecasts continue status quo inequalities, and they actively delimit our social imaginary. Um, so what might imagining social alternatives look like? Um, that's part of the reason we formed this Lancet Commission. We put out a, uh, a paper in February uh, to show what anti-racist modeling might look like. It's called uh, Reparations for American Descendants of Persons Enslaved in the U.S. and Their Potential Impact on SARS-CoV-2 Transmission. Um, and maybe this is something I can talk about at the next talk, but the upshot is that, you know, whereas um, uh, R naught was up towards four in, you know, places like Louisiana, um, a reparative intervention could have brought it down for the entire population down towards, uh, you know, 30 to 60 percent down to around two. Um, and that's because the way, uh, uh, you know, infectious disease transmission works, it's often are not as dominated by the highest you know, dynamics and the highest risk groups. So if you intervene on that group, it, it affects the, the group as a whole. Um, so here's some of the mechanisms. It got picked up in the uh, national news um, and we've received loads of hate mail ever since. And something we can talk about. And I'll conclude with this. 
another form of symbolic violence, uh, how IHME conducts its meta regressions. Um, you know, it essentially takes these very, very proximal variables to, to show why the global South lives um, shorter lives essentially than those in the global North. And the three top reasons are tobacco, hypertension, and alcohol. Um, and so people like say I'm Mike Ambimbola would question whether it's even ethical to publish global burden of disease studies because it really distorts our perception that the causes of all this suffering in the global south are these really, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, downstream variables. Um, and so, you know, to, to look at this as an analogy, there's, as their stated mission is to just use these statistics and put them out there, which, um, would improve the health of world's populations because we're providing the best information. It's someone like saying, you know, they could have improved the, the health of people enslaved in the US in the 17th and 19th centuries. Just going plantation to plantation saying, okay, here count up how many people died of stroke, heart attack, diabetes, and saying, all right, here's your numbers. Uh, you know, you have good numbers. We're gonna improve the health of people. You know, there's no analysis of power. So uh, essentially what the book looks at is, you know, says by tracing human rights failings to the impoverished discursive infrastructure of objectivist epidemiology, we can transform global health by transforming its representations. We can also transform global health by transforming, uh, so this is very much superstructure, right? Uh, we can also uh, transform global health by transforming the base. And uh, while Paul tackles both, um, he does a much better job than me of looking at the sort of material socio-historical determinants of epidemics. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to him and ask that he also uh, discuss um, uh, especially this, uh, what I found was you know, fascinating, this tracing of uh, containment over care paradigm in, in Western Africa. Because when I landed there first, it was with MSF, and I was working at a place in Kailaun where the, the Ebola treatment unit actually had no treatment. They wouldn't let us put IVs in Ebola patients coming in in shock. Um, and, and so again, here was this modern contemporary version of the you know, containment over care paradigm, but um, you know, I learned from Paul that it actually had a long history. So Paul, please take Thank it away. You. Um, and, and thank you, Megan, for having us and the center and IFAM as well. Um, I just want to say at the outset how, how much I uh, love uh, Jean's book and how much I learned from it. Um, and it's not that uh, th these are very complementary uh, studies, I hope, because they're very complementary experiences. I think it's worth mentioning that we first met in Sierra Leone in the middle of the or early in the epidemic. And I had only been there uh, to Sierra Leone uh, one time. It proved to be the first month probably of the urban epidemic. And, uh, and we were not working there. We were there for another uh, matter, uh, which sounds kind of ridiculous. It was there because we were hosting a conference on uh, improving surgical care in resource poor settings to use the latest public health jargon to describe uh, settings from which resources have long been extracted. And the reason that I became fascinated by and, and really angry about control over care um, as a paradigm that shaped so many interventions in places in the world where I've worked as a physician uh, is had, had nothing to do with Ebola. I was already expecting to see it with Ebola. Um, in fact, I have never not seen it I started a, 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 as an aside, a little bit of a biographical, autobiographical aside, Megan. I've just add, um, by way of honesty about uh, age and things, I went to Haiti uh, as a 23 year old in 1983 and, and saw it there, a control over care paradigm, imposed largely by public health people, not the biomedical arena, uh, the clinical arena. And I, but I didn't have a vocabulary to describe it, I didn't know what I was seeing. But so many things happened after that. I'll give an example, the advent of HIV disease. As, as people listening know, Haiti and the United States were caught up really in the same epidemic and at the same time. And uh, so I was going between Harvard and Haiti. I was finishing my or, uh, clinical training at a big Harvard teaching hospital where Gene and I still work um, and going back and forth between these two places. And on the one hand, as I was training in infectious disease, 
we were begging our patients to avail themselves of these new therapies. They, back then they were called AIDS cocktails, antiretroviral therapy. Uh, whereas in Haiti, I knew that everyone would be begging us for these same um, therapies. And as you'll remember at the time, it was the august opinion or considered opinion of many in the global public health arena, which was readily morphed, by the way, into global health uh, today. It was the considered opinion of these experts that it was not possible to treat AIDS in resource poor countries. That term was already uh, emerging, resource poor countries at the time in the, uh, in the 90s. Um, and then the reasons given, um, which are uh, reasons considered in Gene's book, were that it wasn't, it wasn't feasible, it wasn't cost effective, it wasn't sustainable. In fact, it wasn't even prudent. And uh, since it was the leading infectious killer of young adults and in some places children, and we did have an effective suppressive therapy, we knew all along that our job would be to resist that logic and just roll out the staff, the stuff, the space, the systems, and the support to launch these therapy programs uh, in Haiti and later in Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, et cetera. Um, and, you know, so control over care was very familiar. And I could go into uh, example after example, some of them quite outrageous. For example, if you go to a conference uh, on cancer care in resource poor settings and the lead, uh, uh, it was an epidemiologist again, uh, uh, from the World Health Organization on cancer care in resource poor countries would come up to me after a presentation of data and examples from Haiti and Rwanda and say, but do you really think it's possible to treat cancer in Africa? So that's the kind of logic that you're, you're looking at. And the gene addresses uh, most squarely in his book. From Sierra Leone, an example that's obvious enough would be that the British were in Sierra Leone much longer than uh, in many other parts of Africa. Uh, really, uh, formal colonial rule on that continent is a late 19th and 20th century phenomenon more than any else. But the British got to Sierra Leone early and over the 200 years they were there running the place, uh, they founded all of zero medical schools and zero nursing schools. So that, that just, then you ask, well, if there were no clinicians being trained, what was the purpose of colonial, the colonial medical service? And it was to control diseases that might affect British investments or later French, German, Belgian, et cetera, um, and to limit uh, the impact of epidemic disease on cattle, on city dwellers, particularly the white ones. So that was a long history that I expected to find, but we weren't working on that when we were there. We were working as clinicians, Gene and I. So that came later, but what I did get to do during that time uh, was to think about the impact of the control over care paradigm on the patients we were seeing. And, and it's important to note at the outset that every adult patient that we saw, and we saw thousands, um, well, hundreds anyway, and I would imagine, Gene, that we were, were getting close to thousands, every single adult patient who had survived Ebola uh, also survived a brutal civil war. And so uh, the approach that I took to examining what I regard as the same topic as Gene, uh, I don't know if I would call it neo-Kantian. In fact, I don't know what neo-Kantian means, but I'll ask Gene later on this evening. But I'm guessing that it, we agree that this is also related to the drive for a dominant narrative. Uh, Gene uses different language. He, he points out that imposing he talks about imposing interpretation. Well, that's also part of the drive for a dominant narrative. And we wanted to know what the dominant narratives were in part in order to uh, counter them. Super spreading uh, is a perfect example. You know, how did that fit in? Uh, not just to the interpretations imposed or otherwise of what was going on, but the actual Ebola response, which as Gene pointed out, was very weak on care even in 2013 or 2014, 2015, et cetera, throughout the, pan the epidemic. Now in contemplating Ebola um, in West Africa, it's an important exercise to think about, well, what is the dominant narrative that's being uh, you know, promoted and by whom, because there are many narratives being promoted and there are obviously many of them are in conflict, 
but it tends to be the powerful that get to impose a narrative. And that's been the, uh, the way of the world for a long time, I'm sure. But you can't understand Ebola in West Africa without trying to understand how this drive is related to the actions that were taken. And there were many actions taken. Uh, and I would also argue that you can't understand colonial medicine in West Africa without undertaking uh, this historical exercise as well. The way that we proceeded, uh, at least during the epidemic and, and in, in, uh, in my book, during, in the book, was to proceed by um, looking carefully or uh, sharing, learning about the lived experience and the local moral worlds of the people that we were getting to know, first as patients, then as friends and coworkers. And I say that uh, if, if for those who haven't had a chance to look at this, uh, this work, um, what I mean by people who were uh, trans being transformed from patients into colleagues was that we uh, hired almost all of the adult Ebola survivors that we could. Gene was very involved in that part of the work as well. And so, that is still an important way to proceed, you know, to actually sit down and talk to people about their experience and sometimes to sit down and not talk about it and just listen. And, uh, and, and so uh, that's uh, in many ways a great way to, to understand, well, what are the things you would need to know about the history of West Africa and where would you begin? You would certainly include going backwards, the war, as I said, that's, that's part of the lived experience of our adult patients. Same was true in Liberia as well, next door, where we also both work uh, and still do. Uh, but would you have to go back further? Well, certainly you'd want to cover colonial rule since the clinical desert is also, the medical desert is also a clinical desert. And how does a, a part of the world become desiccated and turned into a clinical and thus medical desert? Um, and the answer there lies again in extractive colonial rule. Um, and so I'll just uh, uh, invite people to, uh, in the Q&A, if they'd like to talk about control over care paradigm and how it plays itself out in various parts of the world, including in affluent but in egalitarian countries. Um, it's not really what we saw in the United States or seeing now during COVID. We saw something else. It was not so much a clinical nihilism as much as a containment nihilism. So a very different experience, and maybe we'll get a chance to turn back to that. I would like to say, though, Megan, just before turning it back to you and to uh, the audience, that um, you know, one of the uh, as enthusiastic as we may be, as I am in any case, about decolonizing global health, um, I, it, the focus on the lived experience and comments, interpretations, suggestions, and critiques of the people who were our patients and are our colleagues and friends uh, would bring us back to a sharply material notion of what decolonizing global health would look like. Um, it is not only going to be in the symbolic realm, it's going to be in the material realm. And every patient we talk to, um, to you know, discuss with us, well, where am I going to live? Are my kids going to go to school? Do we have enough to eat? I need a job. And this has been the same thing I'd heard in Haiti when I was in my 20s. It's what I heard in Rwanda, you know, in my 30s. It's and on and on it went. And so I hope that our discussions, even in universities, where universities are the places, in my experience, where the discussions of decolonized global, decolonizing global health are most likely to be pulled apart by, uh, from the material demands that the colonized and formally and colonizers are making, and we're often not hearing. And that's why we keep going back to the importance of staff, nurses, for example. I mean, if, if colonial rule doesn't even give you a nursing school, then who's gonna found the nursing school? Well, the independent Sierra Leone did, but after the end of colonial rule. In fact, our coworkers who were trained, and some of them died, unfortunately, in the epidemic, that who were trained in Sierra Leone um, were trained recently because it was really only in the 70s or uh, Gene, I think it's 80s that the medical school um, was founded. Uh, for example, Humar Khan and Martin Salia, two of our, uh, two of my acquaintances in any case who died of Ebola uh, were in one of the first classes and they were 39 and 41 respectively when they died of Ebola. Um, and so maybe Megan, I could 
stop there and you could open it up. I, I know we, we, we have uh, 20 minutes left, so I hope that's okay. That's great, thank you. Um, so we do have some questions coming into the chat, Gene. I didn't know if you wanted to, to if there was anything specific you wanted to respond to first from Paul's comments. Um, no, thanks. Let's just yeah, okay. move on. Um, so there's a, a sort of, um, I think, helpful definitional, but also it's a big definitional question that came in right away. It just how, how would you describe the steps to decolonizing global health? We have a really diverse audience here. And so I think um, just giving a little more sort of meat on that, that term that you've both been using would be really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I find the term is problematic. Um, and there was a recent article that reviewed um, Mignolo and uh, Mbembe's books on sort of decoloniality, talking about how this sort of, I mean, I, I try to avoid the term decolonize at all in the book, maybe I say it once, because it's, you know, it, it sort of suggests that, you know, we want to get back to something pre- colonial um, and in that way sort of fetishizes kind of the uh, in indigenous over you know modernity when you know Ashiel and Bembe looks at that and says yeah that's not what we want we also don't want to continue with mo modernity what we want is an alternative that sort of can you know get the best of of everyone uh, together and I don't know what I'd call that but it sounds like it might not be decolonized since that sort of lends itself more to this polarized let's get to the to the Eden, uh, to the indigenous Eden. Um, and so that's why I try to focus on, at least from my point, since I'm not a, you know, I don't come from a colonized background, just reporting on epistemic violence. And so I, I you know, the conversations about what to do, I mean, for me, I think what we're doing is, of course, all, you know, and, and colleagues have set up Partners in Health, which is like, you know, kind of a premier material redistribution mechanism. Um, we're also working together with colleagues on a um, uh, on this commission for reparations because I think, as one of our uh, colleagues, Sir Hilary Beckles, who's the uh, uh, from Barbados, who's the uh, chancellor, vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, said, you know, maybe if we think of the 1800s as a century of abolition and the 1900s as a century of uh, aid and development and human rights discourse that maybe the 2000s is a, a century of uh, reparations, which look very different. You know, it's not that you know 0.1 percent goes of the UK budget goes to aid. It's they start to wrestle with, say, the fact that um, as Utsa Patnaik showed, they stole 45 trillion dollars from India alone during colonialism, and imagine how long you know that would take to pay off. So I think it looks like. Um, um, what we're doing now, I could see as a form of transitional justice, you know, a supporting uh, um, 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 kind of humanitarian work materially. I think trying to disrupt symbolically dominant narratives or the way, you know, the way uh, interpretations are imposed. Um, and that's kind of what I mean by symbolic reparations. And then really supporting the overall reparations movement, which would be, is very material in, in what its outcomes uh, are, are, are or could be. Um. Well, I mean, I would just add to that because I agree with all of it. So for example, uh, you're in Sierra Leone as I was last month and Jean was last week. Um, and you know, it was the place and, uh, and one hopes it is not still the place, but was until recently the place in the world with the highest uh, maternal mortality ratio, know that they do not have nurse midwives, modern obstetrics, district hospitals with safety nets linked to ambulances. So maybe one of the things you, you would do is build a new women's hospital, buy ambulances, listen to people when they say, hey, I can't get from my little village here. They don't need an ambulance, but they still need transportation. Uh, other than their own two feet, if they're, unless they're living close and are hale enough to do that. Um, you, if you knew that under colonial rule, there were no medical school or nursing schools or universities uh, worthy of the name founded and sustained, maybe you'd start a new university as we have in Rwanda. And maybe you'd focus it explicitly on equity. That's why we call it the University of Global Health Equity. Maybe you'd make sure that the young people with so much talent, but so little avenue for exploiting it, 
um, could come not just from Rwanda, but from Burundi and the Congo and Kenya and Ethiopia and Tanzania and et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I am very happy that there's a lot of discussion. I just hear more often in these settings uh, a demand sometimes, not just a request, a demand for attention to the material repair that is ne necessary, whether or not we call it reparations, transitional justice, or some other uh, uh, agreed upon rubric. Um, and and I, I think uh, we, we ignore that at our peril. I mean, after all, if you're hearing it said by all the folks you're talking to, or so many of them, then how does it get translated into a largely and sometimes even merely symbolic exercise uh, in an affluent first world university? Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that happens very often. I'm just saying it is a, another kind of uh, deformation and a detournement again of what it is that we're hearing. So, you know, that's plenty of work for many, many lifetimes and, and tens of thousands, if not millions of people just to focus on the material repair that would be necessary to, to lead a life that, let's say, would allow you as a young, Af a young Rwandan woman uh, to be a leader in global health equity. So uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of focus, uh, but I do believe it's the one that we hear most office, often uh, uh, demanded. Um, there are questions coming in fast and furious here as one would expect. Um, I'll, uh, I'll pick one that comes from both a clinical and an anthropological point of view. Actually, one of our um, uh, students here who's a medical anthropology grad student and also a perinatologist who is um, curious to hear a little bit more. Sorry about that. Um, about um, how, from an especially from an anthropological perspective, how forecasts and big data end up being resisted by clinicians and people who are living in the midst of epidemics, how that plays out, um, how it kind of speaks against work that's done through NGOs and other bureaucratic institutions. And I, I think this is a question that also gets at um, a broader question I, I was talking about with some of our students about um, the fact that you two are both on the ground public health practitioners and observers, analysts, sometimes very sharp critics of public health work and how you sort of hold those things together um, and or sometimes hold them apart, you know, how you navigate that. Um. Yeah, uh, you know, in the, uh, the book, I have a chapter called Not So Big Data because the idea of big data is that it is all encompassing and sort of gets to this, uh, you know, more of a objective interpretation. And basically what I say is that, uh, say we're looking at, um, you know, Sierra Leone or Congo Ebola outbreaks, and we're, we're trying to use big data to trace people's movements with their phones, you know, which doesn't even work because people have multiple phones and they share them and all of that, um, that the data is not so big as to talk about why there, you know, why there was an, a big epidemic in the first place. You don't see big data people looking at illicit financial flows to uh, determine outbreak dynamics. You basically just see them using very proximal movement between cities, uh, you know, contact rates, that kind of stuff. And so, so one, I think the idea of dispelling this, this notion as being uh, of big data, <laughs> that it's really just another form of parochial interpretation. Um, the other thing is, I have another chapter about um, how, you know, people's ostensible belief in, in um, um, misinformation and, um, you know, uh, for example, in the DRC, there was this Harvard School of Public Health paper that basically interpreted the bigness of the outbreak um, as having to do with people's ignorance, that they were believing misinformation, that they were refusing the vaccine on account of it, that they thought it was, you know, a U.S. bioweapon, all this kind of stuff. Um, and that is a way of, you know, those were facts that people said that, and then and you put that out there, and it starts this narrative of mis mistrust. And then I hear the WHO and the news media and the uh, Ministry of Health there start saying, oh, it is mistrust that's driving this out outbreak. If only we could get better WhatsApp groups and better pamphlets to drop on them and get a few more chiefs on our side, we could convince them to believe the truth and, uh, and the outbreak would be over. 
Um, so the anthropology side is, you know, you really sit down and you really listen to people, you really talk to them and you find that it's, it, yeah, there, there is this, uh, they do say things like it's a bioweapon. You say, why is it a bioweapon? And you start to understand that these are actually sophisticated critiques of uh, legacies of colonization, that it's almost, uh, I call it, you know, in the book, a kind of a habitus or a structural disposition towards eluding depredation. You know, the, the history of, of their country is well known to them that, Hands were being cut off by King Leopold when you know people didn't gather enough rubber, and the Belgian colonists came in for the rest of the extraction, and then the Belgium and, and the U.S. colluded in the uh, killing of their first elected prime minister and Patrice Lumumba, and then the U.S. installed a Cold War Cold War puppet dictator that allowed they paid basically paid him a little bit to reign from Kinshasa while our corporations uh, ransacked the East, where all the you know it's a very very rich country took the gold, the diamonds, which they continue to do. You know, the Anglo Gold Ashanti, which takes out 93% of the wealth, the gold out of Kivu, um, the, the primary owner or the, the primary stockholder is John Paulson, an American who gave $400 million to Harvard. So that now that we have a Harvard Paulson School of Engineering. So the determinative web comes right to our doorstep at Harvard of like, what supports these, you know, we whitewash this, continued neo-colonial extraction. So I think the anthropology part is like being attuned to the web of determination, not just relying on this kind of conservative methodology that is causal inference and looking at very downstream determinants, but looking at the determinant web, talking to people, finding out what they kind of really are, are getting at with their interpretations. And you find that, you know, that burrow, uh, that way of interpreting it is the one that I want to walk over to because it is a more just way of describing why there was such a big outbreak in the first place. Uh, first, I just want to say, hi, Ashik, how are you? <laughs> um, thanks for, you know, weighing in. And not to forget uh, to, to, to recommend to all those listening, you've probably already done this, Ashik, that at Northwestern uh, sits the anthropologist Adia Benton, who's written so compellingly about this, not only as regards Ebola, but also uh, AIDS in, in Sierra Leone, uh, uh, Ebola, sorry, yeah, Ebola and AIDS, uh, just as two examples. I, I would just add to Gene's epistemological points that ethnographically there was plenty to see in terms of how various instructions uh, allegedly based on big data were resisted by clinicians and patients alike. With clinicians, the first thing that came to mind was the absurd idea of a no touch policy. And, and, you know, the first time I heard that, I was like, well, why do we have PPE? Why, why are we wearing PPE if, we, if you're recommending that for a parturient woman with Ebola who's about to deliver, there's absolutely no reason to try and touch her or the baby at all. And, and, and by the way, those recommendations, uh, which you might as well call anti-clinical recommendations, are still online. Uh, you know, as, as suggestions uh, posted by the largest medical humanitarian organization in the world. Um, that's one thing that we had to resist uh, in order to take anything resembling even decent care of patients to drive down the mortality rate. We had no reason to believe mortality should have been any, anywhere near half of what it was at the beginning or end of the epidemic. And sadly enough, it was as high at the end of the epidemic as it was at the beginning. Uh, close to 70% certainly of healthcare professionals and almost a thousand of them died in Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia. It was 70% at the beginning and 70% at the end. And the only uh, real way of, of uh, uh, you know, being sure that you would not die of Ebola once infected was to get out of the clinical desert. So that, that was a, a, a resistance and a principled and ethical one Obviously, there were attacks on burial teams. There were, there were people who fled. And when Gene was in the Congo, he saw the same thing there. And that's why I think his term, eluding predation, is the right one to describe the, the, the resistance, a better term than mistrust. Um, of course, there's mistrust. I mean, how could, you know, how, how could you come so soon out of colonial rule, end up then with war, and in the grips of the neoliberal fever that is, uh, you know, pervaded so much of this work, uh, mistrust is a perfectly reasonable response until you have more evidence that it, it won't be harmful to you. And I mean, these conversations and observations are deeply resonant, I suspect, for many of us who are watching conversations unfold 
right here in the US around COVID in all kinds of ways. Um, the, I think where you just landed, Paul, is, um, leads nicely to one of the questions um, that we had about wanting you to um, dig a little bit more into the um, control versus care paradigm that you referenced, um, because that's, that's very much sort of what produces the effects that you're talking about, I think. Well, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, it's not really typical of me to say how angry it makes me. Uh, Ashish would know that and my colleagues and you do, um, but it, it's such an outrage uh, to counsel against giving care to the afflicted as again, unreasonable, not prudent, not sustainable, not feasible, regardless of what the pathology is. And if there's any justification for a burden of disease understanding, it's to know what are the leading causes of death among adults and children in a place where you're working, right? You'd wanna know if it's trauma, you know, uh, meaning roadside trauma, you'd wanna know if, you know, why worry about malaria and Lesotho if there isn't any there? So there is a value, of course, uh, in understanding and counting, um, but, you know, what is the purpose of that? The purpose of that is to address the problem. Um, so the control over care paradigm, I believe has really uh, robbed global health and before it, the previous paradigm, which was called international health, has robbed that of, of the, the greatest vitality that might have promised, which is a way of addressing the divergent chant life chances of people as clinical deserts are born. Now, as Jean pointed out, this prelapsarian fantasy about this being great before colonial rule are also rejected by the firmly anti-colonial because back then the entire world was a medical desert. So why would, you, you, why would you want to go back to that? So the control over care paradigm is, you know, th and this is a hypothesis, I haven't seen it written about a lot. Um, it, it, the hypothesis is that it really comes uh, from colonial rule and that it, colonial rule happened at about the same time as a number of very revolutionary discoveries and developments, in, in, especially vaccines. Um, and if you look at the date, it's really the same years that the Pasteurians in France and, and uh, the UK, whatever it was called at the time, the empires, uh, in Germany as well. Uh, at the same time that these uh, developments are occurring in cities in Europe and North America, you, you see the formal occupation of really that 90% of the continent of Africa, you know, uh, if not more. And that was not the case in the middle of the uh, 19th century and certainly not in, uh, in the 18th century. So um, I think that that uh, paradigm, I'm hoping that other historians uh, will say, yeah, that's, that's not too far off. But in the United States, what we saw, it's very hard to sell control over care. And uh, I would imagine it's true in much of Europe or Asia. It, it's resisted for the reasons that we said already, that people are looking when they're sick for care. Uh, in the United States, what we saw, though, was a very different kind of nihilism, and it was around containment. And, you know, most dramatically, that was the case when the president of the Republic, the United States, uh, fell ill with COVID. And that day, I mean, or the next day, uh, his chief of staff said, we're not going to uh, stop COVID in the United States through containment, meaning mask wearing, social distancing, the other kind of uh, hundred-year-old strategies uh, that were used to um, during the big influenza epidemic 100 years ago. Uh, what we're going to do is solve it with vaccines and medical interventions. And that's kind of what's happening. The, the tragedy there is that the slope of decline uh, means that all the people who might have been protected by, you know, the continuation of, uh, of uh, indicated public health containment measures and the vaccines and therapies, all those people uh, fell ill and, and many of them died. And that's really the reason I think, or one of the main reasons that in our patchwork healthcare system and lack of safety nets is why we've done so uniquely poorly as a nation in containing uh, COVID. But we did pretty well in, in some areas, particularly not so much clinically as I thought we would, but the development of vaccines. So I'm noting the time, unfortunately, there's so much more folks would love to dig into some of the um, intriguing terms like bourgeois empiricism and lots of questions about reparations um, and colonialism more broadly that people would love to ask. There's never enough time. Um, but just as a kind of final, again, thinking about the way in which you both occupy these very on the ground and um, trying to 
from within the system also stand outside of it and provide helpful critical analysis. I'm, I, I think folks would be interested to hear um, at this moment that feels like a time of turmoil, but also possibility, um, maybe. What do you feel most worried and most hopeful about? And that's an incredibly unfair question to ask you as we close out, but, um, but I wonder if you could just share some brief reflections um, from, the, from the points of view that you both occupy. It's Jean's turn first, Megan. <laughs> you go ahead. Uh, let's leave the, you're, the, you're more the optimist. I wanna leave this well, on. But, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I, I think it was Jean who once said to me that uh, optimism is his own personal psychopathology, but he needs, needs it for the work, so leave him alone. Um, I, I am, uh, I'm feeling what you're feeling, Megan, if you're describing a sense that a crisis of this nature, you know, and, and that and the, the, the murder of George Floyd is part of it as, as well, and not just in the United States. I mean, yeah. the, if those are indeed the largest mass protests in U.S. history, it's also important to know that they spread across the world, and um, which is a very interesting and heartening phenomenon. I mean, how great is that, that in Palestine, you know, and across Asia, and certainly across Africa, you see uh, protests about the murder of George Floyd. Um, so if there is this moment here, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, about, I want to see an attack on neoliberal investments uh, or lack of them in our safety nets in the United States as an example. Um, I, you know, I want to see radical rethinking about how uh, we consider uh, global health and really whether or not we should use that term without the this, uh, security net of using equity uh, in the title as well. Um, of course, and what I'm most worried about is that that won't happen. Um, and, uh, you know, I see a lot of risk uh, right now in, in the United States um, of, of that not being a sex successful project. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping and praying and militantly engaged in uh, making that a, a true uh, vision and rather, rather than a merely optimistic and illusory one. I just quickly end that I'm, you know, hopeful about this, as our colleague said, becoming a century of reparative justice, trans transcending some of the aid and development paradigms that, as Nkrumah said, are really just revolving credits for uh, continued extraction, but getting to actual um, repairing uh, of legacies through much bigger justice action. Always more to talk about, but we're so grateful for the time we did have together. Uh, and thank you both so much for being with us. This was really um, generative and inspiring um, and terrifying in a good way. Um, and just, we're so glad to have had the time together with both of you. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks everyone for joining us. Our pleasure.